Okay, in this video, I'm going to consider this theorem here about the Ronskian for independence, a test to test if two functions are linearly independent. And I'm going to offer two different proofs of it. One of them uses a system of equations and matrices, and the other uses the quotient rule for derivatives. Okay, so here's the theorem I'm going to prove, and it's we have two functions, f and g, and they're going to be differentiable on some open interval. Now, typically, we have nice functions, and so they're differentiable on negative infinity to infinity. But in theory, we could have some smaller interval, and this theorem would still work. Then, if we have this condition that there exists at least one x such that the Ronskian is non-zero, in other words, the Ronskian function, the fun Ronskian, which is actually a function of x, is not precisely zero, right? It's some function that may be zero at some points, but it's non-zero at other points, then we have the condition that f and g are linearly independent. Okay, first recall what the Ronskian is. We have the Ronskian, it's kind of an operation that takes in two functions, f and g, and it's a function of x, right? And it's equal to the expression f of x times g prime of x minus f prime of x times g of x. And typically, we encapsulate this in this determinant, which has the functions in the first row and their derivatives in the second row. Notice you can take this expression, expand it out, and you'll get this part here. Now again, what this theorem is saying is that if the Ronskin, and I'll get rid of the x part, if the Ronskin is non-zero, then this implies that f and g are linearly independent. Now, because it's more confusing to start with an inequality and then try to derive something, I'm going to prove the contrapositive. So what this means is that we take the opposite of the conclusion, and we say that that implies the opposite of the hypothesis. So this is how it's going to work. This statement right here it's equivalent to this statement. If f and g are linearly dependent, then this implies that the Ronskian of f and g, oh, let me fix that bracket, is equal to zero. Is equal to zero everywhere. Right? This one was said if it was non-zero at at least one point, then it implies independent. Where this is equivalent, logically equivalent to f and g dependent, implies Ronskin is equal to zero everywhere. Now again, the first proof I have is using the quotient rule. Now you actually notice here, this is the why I you like the quotient rule proof a little bit more, is that it's more intuitive, right? We, when we look at this Ronskin, we see that this is looks kind of like the product rule, right? It, it, but it has a minus sign, which makes it look kind of like the numerator of the quotient rule. And you'll see how that comes into play. So, okay, so, so let's start with the assumption. F and G are linearly dependent. Now, what this means is that I can write our function G as a constant multiple of the other function, where K is some real number. And again, I'm not going to write the, um, the of X, G of X, F of X. I'll just write G and F. Know that G and F are our functions. K is our constant. Now, if we divide both sides by f, we get this. And notice that f is not 0, because if f was 0, then, then this is 0 and this is 0. So we know that our Ronskian is 0, and so that will prove the theorem for that case when f is 0. But if f is not 0, then what we can do here is take the derivative of both sides of this equation. So we have g over f is equal to the derivative with respect to x of our constant k. And again, on the left-hand side, we have to use the quotient rule, right? So you remember the quotient rule looks like this, gf prime. Again, I'm not writing the arguments. I'm not writing the x's everywhere over the denominator squared. And on the right side, you can see we have the derivative of a constant, with this, which is 0. And now remember that a fraction, and this is a fraction here, is equal to 0 precisely in the cases when its numerator is 0. Right again, don't worry about the denominator being zero because we are we're assumed f is non-zero. And you can probably see this by now that 
this expression is exactly the Ronskian of f and g. So in other words, this and that concludes our proof, of course, because we started with the fact that f and g are linearly dependent, and then we did a bunch of steps, and then we finally got to say that because f and g was linearly dependent, this implies that the Ronskian is equal to zero. And just to recap, the reason I like this proof is because the, when you realize that the Ronskian of two functions is just the numerator of the quotient rule right here, and you can see f times g prime minus g times f prime. Again, I switched the order here. The order doesn't matter in multiplication. Then it also makes it a little bit easier to remember. Okay, so the second proof actually uses the first formulation of this theorem, the original formulation, which is that if the Ronskian is non-zero, then this implies that f and g are linearly independent. And the way this proof works is we start out with an equation. We have a1 times f of x plus a2 times g of x is equal to zero. Right? We just let this equation be for some constants a1, a2 that are real numbers. And then we want you to determine what are the values of a1 and a2 that will satisfy this equation given that the Ronskian is non-zero, right? We have to use that, that the Ronskian is non-zero. Now, remember, if a1 and a2 satisfy this equation, then they will also satisfy the derivative of this equation. Now, this is kind of a trick, right? You, how would you come up with this on your own? I don't know. Typically, I like to give explanations for stuff, but in this case, it's kind of just an intuition that this is going to help us, and you'll see how it's going to help us in a second. If we take the derivative of the left-hand side, that's what we get. On the right-hand side, it's just zero. And so in other words, if a1 and a2, and again, we want to find the values of a1 and a2 that satisfy the first equation, right? If the only values of a1 and a2 that satisfy the first equation are zero and zero, then this implies that our, our f and g are linearly independent. That's the definition of linearly independence. And so, if they satisfy the first equation, they must also satisfy the second equation. So this sort of sets up a system of equations, kind of. Or not kind of, but it, they do. And we can actually convert this to matrix form to get a better understanding. Use the tools of linear algebra to help us prove this. So if we convert this to matrix form, this is what we're going to get. right? And a key thing to note here is that on the left-hand side, the variables are actually a1 and a2, right? It's kind of weird because we wrote them in the front, but actually, remember, we're given the functions, f and g, but a1 and a2 are just some constants we don't even know yet. And we're trying to determine what, what solutions for a1 and a2 will satisfy that equation. So again, a1 and a2 plays the role, I'll call it the a vector, this is kind of like our coefficient matrix A, and this is going to be equal to the right-hand side, which is just the zero vector, is equal to zero. And you can see this is a homogeneous system of equations, right? The right-hand side is zero. And actually, you probably noticed that, take a look at this matrix A right here. If we take the determinant of A, which is f of x, g of x, f prime of x, g prime of x. This is actually precisely the Ronskian of f and g. Right? It's the definition of the Ronskian of f and g. And we know that this Ronskian is non-zero. In other words, the determinant of our coefficient matrix is non-zero. That means that our coefficient matrix A is invertible, meaning A inverse exists that's a theorem of linear algebra. One way you can convince yourself of that is that, remember, the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix is 1 over the determinant of A times something. You don't even remember need to know what it is. But if determinant A is non-zero, then we're not dividing by 0 and we're all good. We can find an inverse. So again, A inverse exists. And so if I take my equation A times our vector A is equal to the 0 vector, I can multiply both sides by A inverse. I'll multiply on the left. On the left-hand side, the things cancel out. On the right-hand side, we get the zero vector. And so, in other words, a is zero. We have this, and you can see 
that our only solution for A1 and A2 is going to be the trivial solution, both zero. And that is precisely what it means for f and g to be linearly independent. And that concludes the proof.